thankful that God has granted us this opportunity. I know that some join us online and by conference call. Uh, you are recovering from sickness, and we hope that recovery is going well. Or uh, for some, it may be the threat of passing a sickness on to others that has required you maybe to uh, stay away this morning. And uh, there may be other circumstances, but we're thankful that you're with us uh, by those means. To all of you in the auditorium, thank you for being here. It's been mentioned in both prayers already, and I think rightfully so. So much in our world is crazy, if that's the right word to use, chaotic. There is much anxiety and fear, uncertainty as to what will come next. And it seems when one crisis is resolved, or at least some semblance of resolve is achieved, something else happens right on the heels, and it uh, continues to build. And uh, the anxiety of living in the modern age is, uh, is very great. And yet, where else should we be than here with God's people petitioning Him for His care? Some would say it's a vain hope, but we know otherwise. We know that He is in control. And despite all of the things that we may encounter in this life, we give Him thanks and praise that He loves us and will continue to provide and care for us. So thank you for showing that interest and diligence this morning in doing just that. You may have heard about the little boy. It was his first day of kindergarten and his mother anxiously waited, looking out the kitchen window for his return. She wasn't going to meet the bus uh, at the end of the sidewalk, but she let him get off. She watched as he walked up the sidewalk and into the kitchen and just plopped down on the floor. He looked very dejected and after a few moments of silence, she finally decided to ask, as only mothers can, Honey, what did you learn today? The little boy sighed and said, Apparently not enough. They say, I have to go back again tomorrow. <laughs> now I can identify with that, can't you? Back to school and back to learning. But what do we mean by learning? What is learning? Learning is the act or process of acquiring knowledge or skill. There's not a set process by which that is accomplished. A few weeks ago, maybe even months ago now, I told you about how I learned to ride a bicycle. And it's not the advisable way to learn to ride a bicycle, but it was my dad's way of teaching me, and I had to learn pretty quickly. Of interest, if you are at all, uh, my dad had the same philosophy as it regarded swimming and various other activities. The sink or swim mentality was very real uh, in my childhood. But what is learning? Is it just acquiring knowledge or skill? Is it the modification of behavior through practice, training, or experience? Well, yes, those are the things that we mean by learning. But I've recently tried to take a greater interest in that process and really tried to evaluate what I can do to help facilitate that learning. And any teacher, and we have many of them and administrators in the audience this morning, you know that continual education, exposure to different theories and approaches, uh, conferences and workshops, all of those things are a frequent part of your life and your professional development because you want to excel in helping your students to learn. But at the end of the day, you realize it's really up to them. Now you can look at the research, you can uh, read what a consultant has to say or some other expert, and in fact, if you look at those in the realm of religion, you will find a growing con uh, consensus that experts now declare this time that we're spending together right now, the sermon time is dead. Religious lecture as a means of learning, many people are saying we've moved past that as a society, as a culture. Our mindset, our brains are wired, especially those that are younger. You can decide what that uh, term means. Today, they have so many other distractions and so many other uh, gizmos and gadgets, and we have our iPads this and all of these other uh, technology devices that make just simply listening to a discourse something archaic and no longer effective. Well, despite what the experts say, I know what God's Word says, and so to you, 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, Paul said, Preach the Word. The word preach means to herald to cry forth, to deliver the information, the truth, the message that God would have preached. Now, it is true 
And this is where I'm really trying to make evaluation how that we do that and do that effectively while remaining true to Scripture. And maybe we need to have a more involved discussion about that. Jesus said in Matthew 11 verse 29, Come to me, you remember, and learn from me. Learn from me. Are we learning anything? Now, selfishly, and maybe not just selfishly, pridefully, uh, I was reading a book entitled, Why Nobody is Learning Much of Anything at Church Anymore. That's the name of the title of the book. And uh, some of that same sort of reasoning that I mentioned a moment ago is pervasive throughout. No one's learning anything. Well, if you were here this past Wednesday night, you know as we studied together with Brother Bobby Collier, he said, what are we bringing to learn? That is, what mindset? If you come just to listen, if you never open your Bible, if you're thinking about a ball game or about your chicken cooking in the crock pot at home, you're probably not going to learn anything this morning. Is that on you or is that on me or is that on God or someone else or all of the above? I don't know. But I did, I did gain from that little volume that I've mentioned. And one of the things that they said sometimes in times like this, during this period of religious lecture, if we call it that, we try to do too much. Give too much information, abstract concepts without simple stories or examples to demonstrate. And I ask myself, have they been watching YouTube and listening to me? Now the book was written, I think, in the early 1990s, so YouTube wasn't even a thing. They weren't listening to me at that point. But I admit that that's sometimes a fault of mine. I love information. I love uh, when I you know, dig something out of Scripture, and I'm just so anxious and ready to share it with you. In fact, uh, I had, at least on the outset, before I pared it down, about four different ideas that I wanted to explore with you about how the Bible describes learning. But I'm going to simplify it, because that's what the research says to do, and look at but one. Next week, the Lord willing, we'll look at another, and then another, and then another. If God permits this morning, though, think about with me learning by association. It's also called learning by socialization, imitation. Those ideas kind of go right along with it. And it's an ancient concept. It's nothing new. It's not some recent development in the field of uh, psychology or educational theory. In fact, Psalm 106. Psalm 106 uh, is one of the psalms that was given to God's people really to remind them of their history. And it was put in this poetic form, in this lyrical form that they could remember. And so, of course, they would have handy access to this information. They did not have a copy of God's Word to carry around as we do, simply where we could turn and read. And so this psalm and others like them were very instructive and helpful. And parents could teach their children. Children could recall it. Those in older age, even without having access and looking at it with their eyes, could recall in their minds the wonderful acts of God. And that's really what Psalm 106 is about. How God is to be praised for the way He had cared for His people all through the generations and years previous. But listen to this psalm beginning in verse 34. The psalmist said, they, he's talking about the people, the Israelites, the children of Israel who had come out of Egypt, having been delivered through the hand of Moses by the power of God, they did not destroy the peoples concerning whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons, and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus they were defiled by their own works, and played the harlot by their own deeds. Notice verse 35 again. They learned their works. That is, the nations that they were associated with. God had told Moses, and Moses told the people, Numbers 33, you better drive these people out. You better... Take care of them. If you don't, they'll be a snare to you. And there are other word images that are used. They'll be a nuisance. They'll be a pest. They'll be a continual source of not just frustration, but temptation. And not just that, they will do as here the psalmist sadly recounts. In fact, lead you to sacrifice your own sons and daughters and all sorts of other terrible deeds. Why? Because they had learned by association. This morning, let me give you three ideas as it relates to learning by association. The first, we learn by the association that we have with our parents. Now, 
You can't choose your parents' kids. I know you've probably wanted to do otherwise, but you can. Uh, parents, you can't choose your children. Uh, you, so we cannot choose parents, and parents cannot choose children, but parents can choose how they parent. And it's very vital that we do an excellent job in doing that. An ancient proverb says, and it's still proven true day by day, children have never been very good at listening to their parents, but they have never failed to imitate them. And that's true. I could tell you numerous things that frustrates me in my task as a father, and my wife is wise enough to point out to me that they are usually the very same character flaws or defects or weaknesses that I have seen manifest in my own sons. And maybe that's really true. I'm frustrated most of all because I see in my own life where those sorts of uh, activities or attitudes or mindsets have led. And so I'm telling them, boys, don't be like that. Be smarter than dad. Be wiser. That's not new either. Read the book of Proverbs and you will find Solomon telling, my son, listen. My son, listen. And probably many of the things he's warning his son about were things that he had failed at as well. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7, Moses said, You teach your children. When? Always. At all times. When you rise up, when you lie down. At every part of the day, you teach them. And I remember hearing that. I remember reading that before I was a parent. And I'll admit I was intimidated by that sort of instruction. And even, not just intimidated, but a bit fearful. How could I possibly teach my sons all the time? But what I soon discovered, and those of you that are parents, and now maybe even grandparents or great-grandparents, you might chuckle by this realization because you know it's true too. You teach them, but it's the fact of the matter whether you teach them or not, they're always learning, aren't they? And so I think the instruction in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it doesn't mean that I go around all the time, pasting a Bible before their eyes and carrying a big stick that if they were to look somewhere other than at it, I'm to whap them on the head. Now, Moses said, make it a frontlet between your eyes, and the people went to such an extreme, some of them did that. But what he's really asking is, as you live with your children, as you influence them, as they learn by their association with you, work God's Word into every aspect of their lives. And if you do that, it will be very easy and natural I won't identify which of the three, but I'll give you three examples just uh, how it happened in our uh, how it happened in our life, in our family, uh, growing up. And I don't say this uh, to brag or to be arrogant, but just to show you, to give you an illustration so that you might learn as well, especially those that are younger parents. I remember uh, we were somewhere and we were walking along and one of the boys pointed out and said, look at that beautiful flower. All of these examples revolve around the word pretty. They said, look at that pretty flower. Having had a botany class at Freed Hardeman, I said, son, that's not a flower. That's a certain kind of weed. I don't even remember which kind. I was happy that my education had uh, helped me distinguish between a weed and a flower. His response was, God's flowers are pretty, but even the weeds are pretty too, Dad. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty profound thought coming uh, at the time he was four or five years old. Even the weeds are pretty. What's that? Well, that's an opportunity and what we did was to take that and say, it's true, son, that weed is pretty, but you know, there's sin that the devil tempts us with that looks pretty. It looks enticing. It looks like something to be desired, but it's really not. So you need to be careful. You need to make sure that when things look pretty, that they really are. And that was a lesson learned. In connection with that, we were at another place at another time. And it wasn't at a place where this type of thing was usual, I don't think. Uh, but there was a young woman there who was physically attractive. They didn't really understand that. But what makes young women physically attractive to males, uh, she possessed. And unfortunately, she had uh, displayed that in a very immodest way by her choice, or maybe better said, her lack of choice of clothing. And I remember one of the boys looking at her and not knowing, of course, what those per, um, particular parts of her body that she was trying to actually accentuate really meant in his younger years. He said, pretty girls don't dress like that. And I nodded in agreement. I said, amen, son, that's right. That's not something to display. Pretty. Well, pretty by whose definition? By God's or otherwise. And then the last one, you can probably guess which boy this was, and you can give him a hard time about it later if you'd like. Uh, we were driving by, 
in our community, in Overton County, uh, like a lot of uh, communities uh, in years gone by, there was a community beer joint, a place where before alcohol was served uh, with great frequency like it is now in our restaurants, uh, there was that gathering place for the community. Those that wanted to engage in that activity could go to the beer joint. And I remember driving by as we had to, uh, going from point A to point B, and uh, from the back seat in his car seat, he announced and he said, look at those Christmas lights on hell. <laughs> you know, I'm driving long enough. I'm, you know, that's a unique admission. I said, what, son? He said, look at those Christmas lights on hell. And I, and I said, son, I, I don't get what you're saying. And he finally pointed and I kind of turned on my shoulder and looked. And the beer joint had decorated for Christmas and they had a nice Christmas light display. And I said, Christmas lights on hell? He said, yeah, you said that was the bad place. He said, they put Christmas lights on hell. And I went on to tell him that's not really hell, but that is a bad place. That's a place we don't go. And yes, the lights are pretty and everything else, and that's enticing and that's tempting, but stay away from it. Well, what is that? That's Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's when you walk by the way, when you rise up, when you lie down. Uh, wherever you go and whatever you do, as life happens, and it does, we want our children to learn by association God's Word how it applies to their life. I love Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Of all the verses that tell us anything about Jesus, this is one of my favorites. And I know uh, some of you might recognize that verse. Others of you are scratching your head. Luke 4, 16. I remember, that. is that John 3, 16? Is that the God so... No, that's not the God so loved the world passage. Luke 4, verse 16. He, Jesus, came to Nazareth. Where? He had been brought up. In case you didn't know, Luke just wanted to tell you that's his hometown, born in Bethlehem, fleeing to Egypt, going back to Nazareth. Luke's told us all about that. Jesus came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, that's the key phrase, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. I love that verse. As was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day stood up to read. What's Luke telling us? Luke's telling us a great deal. He's telling us something about the training that Joseph and Mary had provided their boy. Now you might say, well, he was the son of God. Where else would he have went? Where else would little boys go if they're not instructed to be in the house of God? They'll go anywhere they please, or they'll go nowhere just staying home doing their own thing, not Jesus. Joseph and Mary had taught him and taught him well, as was his custom. It was his regular habit. There was never a question. I believe it was Brother Gus Nichols. Maybe he borrowed it from somebody else in years past uh, when he said, you know, we never answered the question on Sunday morning, what are we doing today? And people heard him say that and they thought, what's he mean? You're not answering the question. It's Sunday, what are we doing today? He said, we, we, don't, a we don't ask or even answer that question in our house anymore. He said, that question was answered years ago. And so it must it be among all of us who are God's people. That question's settled. It's not a question of asking, what are we going to do today? We're going to God's house to be with God's people to offer our God worship. We learn by association. And we must make sure our association here, I put mama duck or daddy duck with the baby ducks and their teaching. Number two, we learn by association with the one that we choose to go through life with. Here we have a choice, our spouse. And we must exercise great wisdom in choosing. There is debate, and I've read and analyzed, and I could present to you all of the abstract arguments again on either side uh, of the debate as to what 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16 mean. But I just want to read them. Do they apply to marriage? Or is it some other relationship that Paul has in mind? You must decide, but nevertheless, the simple teaching of God's Word reads this way. Paul said, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God. Is that about husbands and wives, about marriage? Is it about business relationships? Is it about all of those and more? You decide. What I know he tells me here is that being unequally yoked together, it's an agricultural metaphor, probably lost on a lot of people today. 
I've never plowed with mules or horses or oxen or any other animal. I plowed with a tractor a couple of times, but I can imagine if you had two animals that were not of the same kind or even of the same size that were not accustomed to working together and you tried to get them to pull in the same direction, you're not going to succeed. As I said, I have more experience with the mechanical side of things, and I know sometimes we had implements that were for one tractor and other implements for the other tractor, and oftentimes if you tried to mix them, they didn't work as well. What agreement? What fellowship? What accord? What part? In other words, how do we get along with someone who is diametrically opposed, whether overtly or even, as it might be more subtly, with our dedication to Christ, to our dedication with God. You see, we learn by our association and that one we choose to go through life with, they need to help us. In fact, uh, as we've told our boys, as I've told our younger folks in times when I've been able to talk about this matter with them, the first rule of dating or romantic exploration or whatever you want to call it is, will this person help me get to heaven? That's the first question, the second question, the third question, the last consideration, the only consideration. And so many, and I, I've seen it, I've done this long enough uh, to know that I've told young people that. And some of them have brushed it off. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'll show him, or it worked in this case or that case. Go back to the Old Testament book of Judges. And I want to show you not only in Judges 16, but in 1 Kings chapter 11. If you want to dismiss the importance of this, just know that those two men, one the strongest, one the smartest, made a mistake in this area and they paid dearly for it. Judges chapter 16, the strongest man physically that ever lived, Samson. The Bible says that after this it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. That's the ominous opening of what will be eventually the downfall of this strong warrior of Israel. He loved a woman named Delilah. Now you can analyze her character. You can say, was he trying to be a good influence on her? You see, uh, maybe you're already thinking, preacher, association cuts good w uh, both ways. Yes, I don't need to be associating with the bad, but I'm good and I'm trying to better the bad with my good. I'm trying to be the leaven. I'm trying to be the light. I recognize, I appreciate that. But I'm asking you to be careful because you can learn, and Samson learned much too late, that Delilah was not the spouse, not the companion that he needed. Oh, you might say, well, in the end, he succeeded. He killed more in his death than he did in his life. Well, do you, is your idea of walking around in a circle, grinding grain with your eyes gouged out, a definition of success? God used him, yes. He might even redeemed him, yes. We can debate uh, that or whether or not his story ended on a high note or not. Irregardless, the strongest man who ever lived made a mistake in this area and he paid dearly for it. 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11, the smartest man who ever lived. Solomon, with wisdom endued and granted to him by God, excelling all of his contemporaries, both past and present, only God's Son, Christ Jesus possessing more wisdom than he as God in the flesh. Above the rest of us, Solomon wiser than all others, but the Bible says he loved, verse 1, many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. All of these nations of whom the Lord said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor are they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. You learn by association, Solomon, be wise. But Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. That's what God's Word says. Now that word there in verse 2 for intermarry is a word that may not even mean intermarry. It may be the word that means do not go among, stay away from. It may even be that strong. The smartest man, the strongest man. You ladies might say, well, you're talking about men. I'm a Please don't dismiss it. The smartest and the strongest have tried to do other than what God would have them to do in this area of their lives. As it relates to a spouse, a companion, a partner in life, a helper, they paid dearly for it. Solomon, in his old age, sees his kingdom begin to crumble from within. 
The book of Ecclesiastes may very well be his cynical looking back on his life. Yes, I know that book ends on the high note of fear God and keep His commandments. That's all that life's about. But you'll read and you'll hear his gut-wrenching explanations of how he had tried wine, women, and song and all of it failed him. So wouldn't it be wiser just to choose as he ends the book that conclusion as your beginning point? To fear God and keep His commandments. So your association, parental, spousal, and then finally, I'm just calling, we learn by association, maybe if you want to say the herd, the herd mentality, the herd association, the following of the crowd that so many want to do. We talked about this at the Bible study hour. Back in Exodus chapter 23, there is this, what I think, a very unusual instruction that God has given to Moses and Moses delivering to the people when He says, You shall not follow a multitude to do evil. You shall not follow a multitude to do evil. Now they were God's people. They were out of Egypt. They were traveling toward the promised land. And yet this instruction was necessary. Do not follow a multitude to do evil. In context, he'll talk about don't collaborate or try to conspire legally to you know, press a false charge or to make some accusation. Don't do any of that. But more broadly, we're just saying don't follow the multitude to do evil. If you watch the nature programs, these are wildebeest. And when the lion starts to um, prowl behind them and stalk them, usually there is a wildebeest that's kind of on point, kind of uh, the lookout for the others. And when he gets spooked and he takes off, all the rest of them take off and follow. Now sometimes it's a false alarm, but you just follow the crowd. Those of you that have worked uh, with other animals, cattle do the same thing. A herd mentality, people do the same thing. And so we have to be careful not to follow a multitude. Don't follow a crowd to do evil. Psalm 1, verse 1, the very first verse in that grand uh, collection of psalms that God's people would sing and worship to Him. He said, Blessed is the man, the person, not just men, but women too, boys and girls, kids of all ages. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now watch. Walks in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands, he stops in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Is there a progression there? I think so. I begin to follow the crowd, but hey, I'm just, I'm not going to do the bad things that they do. I'm just kind of going along to see what's happening. Uh, I'm just interested in learning. I'm just uh, curious to see. But then I stop in the path of the sinners. Well, you know, I'm just observing. I'm not going to participate after all. I'm I'm uninterested. I'm just watching, seeing how it's playing out. But then I sit in the seat of the scornful. There, there's a progression. Walking, standing, and sitting. Watch out for the crowd. Don't follow the herd. Proverbs chapter 1. I mentioned it earlier, but Solomon, that wise man who had made his share of mistakes in many areas of his life, learning by association in a negative way. My son, here's what I want you to know. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. My son... Hear the instruction of your father. Verse 15, Proverbs chapter 1. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. Stay away from wicked people. Yes, I know we're commanded to be salt and light and good influences and leaven. All of that being true. But beware, my son. Proverbs 22, verse 24. There's a warning here, just as relevant as when the ink was drying on the page. Solomon told his son, make no friendship with an angry man. With a furious man, do not go. How many people have got caught up being with the wrong person at the wrong time? And no matter your age, that's a threat. That's a danger you need to avoid. I think of Acts 22 and verse 20. You want to know a man that lived with regret, having been at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people? Paul can tell you something about that. And so even after describing his marvelous conversion and the grace given to him by Jesus on the Damascus Road and his subsequent obedience to the gospel after having been instructed by Ananias, Paul still, many years later, maybe with that image of Stephen losing his life, seared into his conscience and even into his mind's eye, he said, when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. Paul, you weren't throwing rocks at him. You were not stoning them like the others. Paul, what do you mean? I stood by. I consented to his death because I did nothing. I was there. I guarded the clothes of those who were killing him. 
he lived with that regret all of his days. And there are things that so many who are older can tell those of you who are younger that we've done that we regret still. Yes, we may have been forgiven, and Paul no doubt had been forgiven by our Lord, and he preached his gospel faithfully. But don't you imagine there were nights when Paul woke up in a cold sweat hearing the voice of Stephen again or seeing his face bloodied and bruised by the stones being hurled at him? We learn by association. We learn by those we associate with. The herd, if you will, be careful. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, that's where most of you probably thought I would start, but we're circling back to it now at the end. Bad company, bad companionships, corrupts good manners, good morals. It's translated a variety of different ways. Paul said, you need to know that. Don't be deceived. It's true. Bad company corrupts good manners. Now, good morals, good character. Of interest, that's a statement. I hesitate to say not from the Holy Spirit. It's inspired. Paul recorded it. The Holy Spirit guided him in writing it, but it's not original to Paul. The Greek dramatist or playwright Menander had written these words even before Christ walked the earth. Paul's repeating them because they're true. They accord with actual reality. And God knows it to be true, so He recorded it for us. The people we are around, good or bad, they influence us. And bad company can corrupt good character. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 15, 14, talking about the Pharisees. Who are they? Well, for the people of the first century, they're the ones we should follow. Those are the people we want to rub elbows with. Those are the people that we want to take notice of us. That's what the ordinary Jew thought. But, Paul, or, but Jesus said, no, be careful. Don't be with these people. Don't associate with them. Let them alone. They're blind. Blind leaders of the blind. If the blind leads the blind, what happens? Both fall into the ditch. Jesus is asking, consider who you follow. Consider who you associate with. And this is of importance no matter your age. If you're a kindergartner, if you're a college freshman, uh, if you're in the assisted living facility, be careful who you associate with. No matter your stage of life, they are going to influence you. They are going to make an impact on you. How do you learn? You learn by association. And these things we must learn, making sure that we are learning from our God, learning from His Son, learning from His Word, following His will. If you'll let me take back to that picture there. Some of you may have seen this picture before. When I think about our world today, even the last few weeks or days, it's troubling times that we live in. I know that's nothing uh, but the obvious, and you know that as well as I do. And those things that we mention in our announcements and in prayer, they're pressing on our hearts and minds in this country, in our state, and even around the world. What do we do? I keep trying, of course, uh, to put contemporary events within a context of larger um, you know, events from the past and historical uh, frameworks and references. Uh, that's just kind of the way I try to view life. And in fact, uh, I think that's what Romans 15, 4 is telling us uh, as it relates to God's will. The things He's written before have been written for our learning. So one of the surprising things about our own day, and maybe we shouldn't be if we look back just a few generations ago that some of you recall much better than I do, when Adolf Hitler came to power in Nazi Germany, he was quite surprised, at least from the sources that we have remaining, telling about that time period in history. Uh, the German hierarchy was really surprised at the willingness of the German people, the common German people, to accept the atrocities that began to be uh, carried out against the Jewish people. They were really surprised. They thought they would get some pushback on that, uh, but they got very little. Hitler and others played up the pride and the superiority of the Aryan race, uh, the German race of people, uh, the unimportance, the inferiority uh, of the Jewish race and others like them, uh, the fear uh, that they were trying to capitalize on, those fear tactics. And if you're beginning to see that maybe there are some parallels with that day and our day, then you're getting the picture I'm trying to draw. Look at the black and white photo that you see here in uh, the picture. Actually, the original is much larger than this. I've just kind of condensed it down for you. It's 1936. It's a Nazi rally in Hamburg, Germany. You'll see a wave of unbroken Sig Hill or Heil Hitler salutes because he's in town to christen a new German Navy vessel. 
But if you look closely, and I've got him circled there, there's one man not going along with the crowd. August Landmusser. My German's not very good. Brother Elon can correct me, but August is his first name. He's standing with his arms crossed. Now this photo was first printed in a German newspaper in 1991. To our knowledge, uh, Nazi commanders and government officials uh, never made the connection with Mr. August's act of defiance, from what we know. But his story is an interesting one. He had been a loyal Nazi, not just sympathizer, but member of the party, up until 1933 when he met Irma Eckler. It was a perfect love story, except for one major problem. She was a Jew. He was a German. And so he was kicked out of the Nazi party uh, when that relationship was discovered. He applied and appealed for a marriage license, but that was denied under the harsh Nuremberg laws. Uh, that was then the law in Germany that forbade such actions. Still, he and Eckler continued their relationship, and in some semblance, I guess, of what we'd call marriage, even though it wasn't recognized by the state, uh, they had a child together, Ingrid, in 1935. Seeing that things were deteriorating further, he tried to flee the country in 1937 for Denmark, but was arrested. This photo was taken in 1936, as I mentioned. He was arrested for dishonoring the race, his German race. He was sent to a concentration camp. His wife, Irma, was sent to a euthanasia center, as they were called, where she met her demise in 1942 after giving birth to their second daughter. That first daughter, what became of her, we do not know, but the second daughter, Irene, born before uh, her mother's death, actually survived and wrote a book about this entire ordeal. Landmesser was released from the concentration camp in 1941 and drafted into the German army as their forces were taking heavy casualties, of course. He went MIA during fighting. Some suppose that he may have surrendered or willfully uh, even charged uh, so that his life would be taken, knowing what had happened to his family. We don't know his end story. But what we know that on a day in 1936, when everyone else stood and saluted evil, he would not. He would not go along with it. And he stood defiant, even against the crowd, even against the totality of what was most, if not all, of his German brothers and sisters. It takes courage to do things like that. And while, again, I don't know all of the details of his life and certainly any of his beliefs otherwise, I know that here is a man who understood that even though the crowd is saying one thing, even though everyone else is saying, it's all right, go ahead, it's time to do the right thing. And when that time arrived, he was willing to have the courage to do it. I don't know about you. I don't know about me. I don't know what we'll face. Uh, when I was younger, I guess I was naive to think things will always be smooth sailing. This is the United States of America. Uh, we're the most powerful. We're the strongest. We're the bravest. We're the richest. We're the all of whatever. These last few years have maybe brought to our attention some of those things are not as sure as we once believed. But what is still sure is that our God is still God. His word is still true. His hope is still uh, certain. And His promise of judgment is still something that we live in anticipation of each day. Looking to it not with fear or not with anxiety, but with confidence that as His people through His Son Jesus, we stand forgiven. We stand saved by His blood, rejoicing in His grace and again confident that eternal life will be ours. This morning, how are you learning? What are you learning? I don't know. You may say, well, my learning days are behind me. I got done uh, with school a long time ago. I don't want to go back. You're still learning, even by those that you associate with each day. Do I want you to influence others for good? Yes. Are we to be light uh, in a world of darkness? Absolutely. But I'm cautioning you to please understand that learning um, is something that when we associate with those that are evil, that are opposed to our God, we have to be cautious and very aware that they do not lead us away from our steadfastness, as Scripture warns. This morning, we want you to learn the simple plan that God has for your life. It's the acceptance of these facts and the obedience to them that brings you assurance of the promises God has made and the hope of eternal life. You can be forgiven. You can make your life right with the Creator this morning. You can have the gift of Jesus, His sacrifice in your place, the blood that He shed to offer you forgiveness 
the, the benefits of that can be yours if you'll hear that good news message, the gospel, if you'll believe in it, that He is the Christ, that He is the Son of God. He was who He claimed to be. If you'll turn your life over to Him, if you'll repent, change your way of thinking that leads to your change of acting and trust in God, if you'll confess that faith in the Savior, if you'll be baptized, a word that simply means to be immersed in water, an idea, a practice that uh, for many they see no connection uh, with that in their current state other than reading God's Word reveals simply that that instruction, that command was given beginning with the first announcement and proclamation of the Gospel in Acts chapter 2 when those who had murdered the Son of God wanted some ability for their sins to be forgiven. They knew they could not attain it on their own. Peter and the others preaching that message of the Savior said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. If you do, you will receive the forgiveness of your sins. This morning, that's the simple message and instruction we give you. Not from what we desire uh, or what we have originated, but simply from what God has commanded and instructed, we ask you to obey. As a child of God this morning, be very aware of who you associate with. Be very cautious about that. Again, regardless of your age, uh, parents do a good job associating and uh, teaching your children as you lead them, as you ask them whether you intend to or not to imitate you. Make sure that example you set is a good one. Help them understand the importance of the spouse they select and be a good spouse to those of us who have already selected one. Help them get to heaven and may they help you as well. And then let's stand against the crowd, even if we must, in times of great peril or trial, continue to do what's right. Standing for what's right, even if we stand alone, we'll still stand with God. Paul said in first or in Second Timothy chapter four, when I stood before Caesar, no one stood with me, but the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me. You'll still do that this morning. Maybe there have been times when you've not stood for the Lord. Maybe you've went along with the crowd. Maybe uh, you've learned by association things that are contrary to his will. Will you repent of that this morning? Will you turn back to him? Will you allow him to forgive you once more? We stand ready to help you as God's family in this place. We want to share His love with you. And if we can do that and help you by your response to the gospel, please come now as we stand and sing. To